Good morning. Praise God. You know, I want to start off with a little joke. Uh, you know how they always start to show Saturday Night Live by saying, Live from New York is Saturday night? I guess we should say, Live from Des Moines is abundant life, you know? That's right. J James is not the only one with the jokes. Anyway, uh, I want to share with you a word that the Lord gave me on Friday. Um, based on two different situations that uh, took place. And I'm, I'm kind of going to read from this that I, that I wrote, but I'll try to make it more of a, I don't know, conversation if you want to call it that. Uh, new year, new blessings, more grace. Today is the first service of 2015, and this is the year of the affirmation when we will see the manifestation of God's promises in our lives. We start this year with the confidence that God said he'll do, that what God said he'll do, he will do, for he cannot lie. Uh, I've been feeling a restlessness that has awoken in people around us, and they're starting to ask questions, wonder about things. Those are the moments that the Spirit is going to use to speak to those that are searching, whether it is through us or directly to them. Uh, I have a friend at work that she's a non-believer. And recently, um, her two-year relationship ended, so she has been very distraught, and you can say even she's been depressed. So a few days ago, she sent me a message at work and she asked me this question. Can I ask you a question about you and your breakup? I said, yes. She said, I don't know how often you get to talk to your wife, but how do you stay so strong and not want to break down every day? So to give you a little bit of backstory, that day when I got to work, I was feeling something in my spirit that had me at ease, but I didn't know what it was. As soon as she asked me that question, I had my answer. So after I read that and I thought for a few seconds uh, about how I was going to answer that, the Spirit gave me the words that I was supposed to tell her. And this was my response to her. The answer I'm going to give you is strictly for me, from my perspective, and the things I have experienced. Everything started to change for me when I went to church one day and I told God that I was putting my life in his hands. I started experiencing things that I cannot explain, but I knew that something was happening to me because of it. I have read books, I've been to a marriage counselor, and as I went through those experiences, I started understanding many things that I did not know before. I realized that I did not love my wife like I should have loved her all along. I started seeing her with different eyes, the eyes of the spirit. And I see her now differently, which is what caused me to fall in love with her more than before regardless of what's happening. I also live my life every day by these three things. Number one, God is love. Number two, I know he will grant me the desires of my heart because his promises to us will come to pass. Number three, if I allow myself to approach others and treat them the way I feel inside, I know things will get better. I know that you and I don't share the same beliefs, but to me, that is what gives me strength every day and also to get up and say, today is going to be a good day. Amen. After I sent her that, uh, you know, before I say this, one thing that I have somewhat struggled with is when, when we talked about how she's feeling when she asked me, I've been wanting to say this for so long, but because we don't share the same beliefs, I'm trying not to make her mad. Like I'm forcing something on her. But I knew that was the exact moment where I was supposed to say those words. Mm -hmm. So after I sent her that, she said to me, I am glad that you have found God and that makes it easier for you. Thank you for sharing with me. Maybe I will find something that makes me feel what you do. So something happened Friday uh, 
and based on the circumstances, it, it has me thinking, and that's basically what I am seeing, that everything around me right now says that my marriage is over. However, I believe and know this, there is something far greater than my circumstances, and that is the word of God. You know, God has made me some promises. He has promises to us in the Bible, but he also gives us individual promises. When he tells you, I am going to give you this, this is what you're going to have, and he gives it a name and a last name, you know that it's meant for you specifically. And he has told me, do not worry, trust me that I am taking care of this. The Bible also says that every good and perfect gift comes from, um, from above, James 1.17. It is because of that verse that I can look at Psalm 27, verse 13, which says, I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living and know that I will see the goodness of God. I will see it in my life. I will see it in your life. I will see it in the life of those around us those that are called to be here but are not here yet, and those that are put in our paths, whether it's for them to bless us or for us to bless them. Amen. I will see the goodness of God all around me. Yes. Second Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20 says, For all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. Yes. One time I heard someone read this verse this way. All the promises of God are yes, and with us is the amen. It's God's job to say yes to the promise. It is our job to agree with the promise or say it is just as God says it is. Now I ask you, do you agree with the promise? This is not a rhetorical question. I'm asking you, do you agree with the promise? Yes. All right. Then let's continue to utter our amen to the promise, for we will see the goodness of God in the land of the living. So with that, yes. settled in heaven. His word is settled. Yes. It's final. And our responsibility and the reason we have flesh is to enable that word to become a reality in this realm. Mm -hmm. That's why believers still have bodies and not just floating around. It gives us a legal right to declare that word in this realm and bring it to pass. That's what, that's what Jesus did all the time he was here. Amen. Amen.
purpose, we don't even fully know. Right. And I want to say, we don't know who we are yet. We dare and think we've been taught that it's just horrible to think you might be something special in the Lord. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I don't say that boastfully because I think sometimes when it speaks of tribulation that has never been before and never will be again, a lot of that is for us. We're going to face tribulation that has, it's a spiritual tribulation yeah. along with what goes on in the world, but a spiritual tribulation that God knew we had, I, I've done some work on the spirit and each of us has a spirit, a human spirit that God can, has seen and he knows. It's the very spirit that he said, those that he foreknew, he predestined. Yes. He foreknew just like when that angel Gabriel came to visit that little virgin Mary. You can look this up. She's the only one that didn't just freak out, fall on her face, horrified. And I, I'm convinced that she didn't because one, she was as good as a person could be. She wasn't afraid. Uh, uh, she was not intimidated. Uh, and she accepted what he said and said, you know, then let it be to me, whatever, yeah. you know, what you say. And I believe that was so important because her offspring was also going to have that spirit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Obedient unto death. And I don't think we realize it, but we have that spirit also. Yeah. See, we don't even know it. We don't know. It's not based on performance. Right. Yeah. It's based on something we don't even understand or know. But God has, again, in the fullness of time. Now, my brother had a dream the other, the other day, and he was really gotten by it because in the dream, himself in a way that he, he's not done. And of course, we cheer and we're excited, but that brings persecution. Because we're after God moves. But here's the thing that we got to hang on to, Robert, and remember. Wherever sin abounds, and I'm the one that looks out and I think, oh my God, this whole world's going crazy. He said, grief abounds with grace. Until we got to the point, and it's us. He was there all the time. Right. But we had to get to the point where we didn't only believe it, we knew it. Yeah. We yeah. knew it. Yeah. I, I can't explain that, but it would be like mm -hmm. getting up this morning and knowing, un, without question, sun's going to come up in the east. Yeah. You see, the devil always works on the deal that he makes us, it, it won't if it comes up in the west. Right. Yeah. But we know it won't come. That's the same way with him. It has to be as he said. Yes. Yes. So whenever there's a doubt, and Jody and I, we all have them, we'd be liars if we said, right. even at this point, right. that the, it mar I marvel sometimes that the enemy will throw yeah. junk at you that you thought, don't you ever give up? No, you never will. Yeah. He's doomed. He will never give up. But he can never. If it were possible, the very elect would be deceived. Well, that tells us it is impossible.
Jinx. Sheila. Anyone else? 
Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
All right, let's speak the word. Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? I am a believer, and these signs do follow me. In the name of Jesus, I cast out demons. I speak in new tongues. I lay hands on the sick, and they do recover. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. Therefore, I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every disease, germ, and every virus that touches this body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. Every organ and every tissue of this body functions to the perfection to which God created it to function. And I forbid any malfunction in this body in the name of Jesus. I receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of my understanding being enlightened. And I am not conformed to this world, but am transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is renewed by the word of God. The Lord rebukes the devourer for my sake, and no weapon that is formed against my finances will prosper. All obstacles and hindrances to my financial prosperity are now dissolved. The Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of the servant, and Abraham's blessings are mine. Mark and Peter, would you mind taking the offering, please? <laughs> we'll switch it up a little. It's New Year. And Peter, can you say the blessing? Let's worship. Hallelujah. You ready, church? Yes. As the worship team finishes taking offering. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> yeah, multitasking. Hallelujah, Lord. worship team today. <laughs> Service. We'll, we'll be parking cars afterwards. Okay. Hallelujah. One, two, three, four. Come to 
bright and morning star. Jesus Christ he is Lord forever. He's the Prince of Peace. Bright and morning star. Jesus Christ, you are Lord forever. Can't stop praising his name. I just can't stop praising his name. I just can't stop praising his name, Jesus. Can't stop praising his name. I just can't stop praising his name. I just can't stop praising his name, Jesus. Everybody sing, can't stop, can't stop praising his name. I just can't stop. Praising his name, I just can't stop praising his name, Jesus. Can't stop praising his name, I just can't stop praising his name, I just can't stop praising his name, Jesus. Can't stop praising his name, I just can't stop praising his name, I just can't stop praising his name, Jesus. Can't stop praising his name, I just can't stop praising his name, I just can't stop praising his name.
first, all that with yonder. All that with yonder sacred throng, he at his feet may fall. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him on you we stand with the 24 elders casting down our crowns Lord at your feet hallelujah Lord be lifted high be lifted high for your glory be lifted high Be lifted high for your glory. Be lifted high. You're the king of all the ages. You're the author of salvation. You're the reason why we're singing for your glory. Lord, release the sound of heaven. Let it rise to every we will join the anthem singing of your be lifted high be lifted high for your glory be lifted high be lifted high be lifted for your glory be lifted Everlasting Father, you're the all-consuming fire, you're the reason why we're living for your glory. We will be the generation calling down the rain from heaven. We will join the everlasting of your glory. Yes, we will, Lord. Yes, we will. Jesus to every nation glorify your name so be lifted high be lifted high higher higher Lord be lifted high be lifted high higher Be lifted high, 
Hashem, for your glory be lifted high, be lifted high, be lifted high, for your glory be lifted high, be lifted high.
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for healing, for delivering, for prospering, for breakthrough in every area, Lord. We celebrate this year in expectation that your word will be proven true again and again and again. Thank you, Jesus, for allowing that truth to be revealed in us and through us. We bless your name today, Lord. We celebrate every victory we'll experience throughout this upcoming year. We celebrate it today in faith, Lord, knowing that it has already been done. It's already accomplished. It was accomplished 2,000 years ago on Calvary, Lord, where you said, it is finished. We amen that this morning, Lord. It is finished. Hallelujah. Be it unto us, even as you have declared. Yes, Lord. In Jesus' name. Give the Lord a big hand clap this morning. Praise God. Praise God. Amen, amen. Praise God. God bless all of you. You may be seated. Thank you, worship team, as always. Hallelujah. And uh, if there are any young people here, you can be dismissed to go downstairs. Hallelujah. A lot of people out today, first service of the new year. And uh, it's really cold out. Praise the Lord. It was at my house anyway. I'm assuming it was at yours too, or you wouldn't have left it to come here. Praise the Lord. Amen. <clears throat> God is good. And uh, appreciate all that the Lord is doing in our lives and what he will continue to do throughout our lives. Amen. So I want to move right into the message this morning and uh, begin with Galatians chapter 2 and uh, verse 20, and then we'll go to 1 Corinthians, but first, uh, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, how many of you believe that you are the righteousness of God in Christ? Yes. Hallelujah. He's already declared that about you, already has told you, amen, that you are righteous, not by anything that you've done or could do, but by the perfect work and life of Jesus Christ, Amen. He has imparted his righteousness to us, and he took our sin upon himself. Amen? And all of our sin, all of our sin has been judged in Christ. God poured out his wrath on Jesus so that he could pour out his love and his mercy and his forgiveness and his grace upon us. And that's what we're experiencing. This is the dispensation, if you're a dispensationalist, of grace. If you're not... It's the age of grace, amen? It's the time of grace, praise God. So uh, if it's the time of grace, then that's what God, that's how God is dealing with men at this present time, by his grace. If it weren't for that, we could then declare every catastrophe a judgment from God. Now, I know people do that, but it's bogus because this is grace. This is the age of grace. Yes, there are bad things happening in the world. We live in a fallen world. There are many people who are fallen, who have not been redeemed, who are still in that fallen state uh, that Adam placed all of us in through the original fall. But if a person is born again, if they have trusted in Christ, they have been redeemed. They have been put back into that original condition and that original position of grace. Amen. No longer under law. Amen. The law is good, but the law can't make you good. The law only exposes your bad, your evil, your, your, your inability to keep it. So God comes along with a greater law, the law of love, and extends grace to each and every one of us. And that's where we're at today. That's where we will be at until the return of the Lord and judgment will come again, amen, on those who have not believed in Christ. But as was said already a couple of times this morning, every knee is going to bow, yeah. every tongue is going to confess. Yeah. You can do it voluntarily, but you're going to do it. Everybody's going to, hallelujah. He gives us the opportunity, amen, to do it right now voluntarily, just saying, yes, I agree, thou art the Lord. I don't understand all the theology. I don't have all the answers for everything, but I acknowledge you as Lord and Savior. Praise the Lord. So here Paul says in, in Galatians, speaking to the Galatian church in, in Galatia, in chapter 2, verse 20, he says, I am crucified with Christ. You could put your own I in there if you're born again. 
you have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, you live. And yet it's not you that lives, but Christ lives in you. And the life which you now live in the flesh, you live by the faith of the Son of God who loved you and gave himself for you. Can you say praise the Lord? Amen. Amen. So it's no longer your life, according to Paul, that you now live. It's Christ living through you and in you. Amen? All right, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and uh, beginning at verse 21. Now, as someone has already said this morning, with greater manifestation and revelation, of course, with greater revelation comes greater manifestation, and with greater manifestation comes greater tribulation. Meaning people will persecute. They'll say things about you either to your face or behind your back or in some other subtle way, but people are going to do that. Uh, the more you realize your position in Christ, the greater threat you are to the kingdom of darkness. Therefore, people will come against you, recognizing it's not really people, it's a spirit that has to have somebody to operate through, just like the Holy Spirit does. Amen? So it's not the people that we got a problem with, it's spiritual wickedness and high places amen, amen. so here's here's paul and he's speaking to this church this corinthian church and he said therefore let no man glory in men for all things are yours let's continue on sheila i want to go right on down through chapter 4 verse 7. whether paul or apollos so he says don't let anybody take pride in, in people in men for all things are yours whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. Now, the problem was people were, were denominationalizing already. I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos. I, I'm of Cephas. I like what Cephas said better than what I like what Apollos said. That's what's happening here, and that's what Paul is addressing. So Paul, whether it's Paul or whether it's Apollos or whether it's Cephas or the world, or life, or death, or things present, or things to come, they're all yours. And ye are Christ's, and Christ is God's. Let no man, or let a man, so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. But with me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged of you, or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not my own self. For I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified? But he that judgeth me is the Lord. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, with both, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts, and then shall every man have praise of God. And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself, and to Apollos for your sakes, that ye might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory, as if thou hadst not received it? Praise the Lord. So this is where we're going to stay pretty much for the next few minutes, and I say that with all religious truth, praise the Lord. But what I think is interesting in this uh, scripture here in 1 Corinthians is it, that it gives us insight into self. Now, it gives us also, a, there's a way of seeing ourselves that is completely different from the traditional religious viewpoint. And the three things that, that Paul shows us here are, one, the natural condition of the human self. Praise the Lord. Two, the transformed sense of self that Paul discovered. He talked about it in Galatians, where he said, it's no longer I that lives. He said, I'm, born, I, I, I'm crucified with Christ, yet I live, but it's not me that lives. He, had a, he discovered something. There was a revelation that came to him, and he's talking about it here again, only now he's talking about it to the, the church in, Galatia, in, in Corinth. Excuse me. And so 
he says, I've discovered this thing, and it's brought about through the gospel. This transformation of self is done through the gospel itself, by grace, in other words. So number three, then, he tells us how to get that transformed sense of self. That's where we are individually and as a group, I believe, in our walk with the Lord right now. It isn't that we're not born again. It isn't that we haven't seen miracles and had great things happen. But there is a transformation that takes place that, that we haven't really discovered or really been able to identify or, or realize, for that matter, because of the traditional teachings that all of us have, have lived under. And so that's what I want to address this morning. So let's go back here, uh, 1 Corinthians again, chapter 4 and verse 6. Because this, this will open up all sorts of reality to you uh, in, in a lot of different ways than what we have ever really thought about and how it influences not only our lives but the lives of people all around us. So here Paul says, And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that ye might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. So Paul urges the, the Corinthians to have no more pride in one person over another person. Not yourself, not another person, not someone outside of you. doesn't matter. He's saying they're just people anyway. They're just, they're just human, right? And the word that he uses here for pride is, it isn't hubris. It isn't the Greek word for hubris that we usually think of as being prideful or arrogant or whatever. It's actually physiou which is a Greek word that literally means to be overinflated or swollen. Well, Paul says that that's the natural human self. The natural human self is overinflated and swollen. It has nothing to do with what you eat. It has to do with what you believe. Praise the Lord. So then, by definition, the natural condition of the human self is, is four things, and that's what I'm going to deal with here to begin with. First of all, based on everything that Paul's telling us, and we, Sally and I were talking about this yesterday evening, uh, or afternoon, I guess it was. Uh, first of all, the human self is empty, number one. Number two, it's painful. Number three, it's busy. And number four, it's fragile. Now, that's based on this human condition that Paul has described as physio, which is swollen, amen, or uh, inflated. Okay, the self is puffed up and overinflated, and it's empty. Amen. It try it the, the the self tries to to build an identity around something besides God. Self is empty. Praise God. H have you ever thought about the fact that you know you're out walking around, you you don't really notice your body until something's wrong with it. Now, you know, I'm believing for this neck thing to be totally, you know, healed of it, and it does actually feel much better at this moment than it usually does. But I'm driving, and i got to pull up at an angle to, to see back, you know, because I can't t turn my neck far enough around. It's just, it's just awkward, and it's uncomfortable. But, you know, I never noticed my neck for 60 years. I mean, you know, to speak of, until all of a sudden it starts giving me trouble, and now I can't get it off my mind because every time I turn my head, it's there, right? So, I mean, that's the way, that's the way we are. You, don't, you can be walking around, and you, you're not thinking about your toes. I guarantee you, you've been walking in and out of here today and back and forth. You're not thinking about your toes, unless your toes are hurting. They don't mean, you know, you don't realize the, the genius of an elbow, until that elbow is a tennis elbow, you know, or until you've got inflammation or until you've got a pain. Yeah. You don't think about it. You just do all the stuff you do, and it's great. Yeah. But it, it's not a conscious thing. It's just there until it gives you trouble, and still it, until it hurts. Amen? We, you know, we only think like this because previously it felt better than it does now. 
right? And that's because the parts of our body only draw attention to themselves if there's something wrong with them. It was a great lesson, <laughs> praise the Lord, to be learned from this. The self often hurts. How many times have you had people say, well, they hurt my feelings? That's impossible. Your feelings cannot be hurt. <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying. Yeah. The self hurts because there's something wrong with it. It's always drawing attention to itself. Just like an ache or a pain in any body part does. Every day, all the time, self wants attention. It wants us to think about how we look. Obviously, I'm not that interested. <laughs> Praise the Lord. It wants us to think about how we're treated. I mean, come on. We know we, we're not Carly Simon. You're so vain. But it's hard to walk past a store window and not look. Not because I, you know, I mean, come on. Not because it's so great. It's just, it's just your, your self wants attention. It wants your attention. Praise the Lord. So, you know, I, I'm, just, I'm saying that we say our feelings are hurt, but that's a, it's a wrong. It's the self. My identity. My feelings are fine. It's myself that hurts. Right? I mean, walking around doesn't hurt unless my toes are bothered, unless there's something wrong with my toes. Right? Unless there's something already wrong with them, I don't notice them. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Myself wouldn't hurt unless there was something wrong with it. Now, this isn't just about me, but I'm more than happy to ask myself, and you can just Stick your own self in there wherever you want to, hallelujah. But it's true of humanity. That's what Paul is telling us. Think about it. It's, it's not easy to get through an entire day without feeling ignored or snubbed or put down or rejected or, you know, stupid. What was wrong? What was I thinking when I said that? Believe me, it happens to me every Sunday. I, I go home and I think... What in the world were you thinking when you said that? Because I know how many people could be offended if they took it un, in a way that I didn't necessarily intend it to mean, but yet I still said it in a way that was easily able to be translated into a way that they could be offended by it. You understand? I mean, I'm saying, but every day we go through our lives thinking, oh, I wish I hadn't said that. That was a stupid thing to say. I'm, I'm an idiot, you know, or, or you know, People just kind of brush you off or snub you or act, you know, jerky to you. And, you know, you, you just feel like, well, uh, I, I need to correct this. You know, get down on yourself, I guess, is what I'm saying. Well, <laughs> praise the Lord. Psych 101. I always hated that when I exposed myself and everybody else is going, geez, uh, he makes me feel really normal. <laughs> I feel really good about myself. He's a mess, but I'm doing all right, you know. So anyway, praise the Lord. We, we get down on ourselves because something's wrong with myself. Right? Something's wrong with my identity. It always draws attention to itself. So first of all, it's empty. Praise the Lord. And second, it's also painful. And third, self is busy. In other words, always trying to draw attention to itself. Busy trying to fill the emptiness. Praise the Lord. Verse 6 again. This will help you, believe me, if we ever get it. And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes that you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. So self tries to compare itself with others. 
listing accomplishments, failures. It's always busy. Trying to create our self resume. Praise the Lord. So it's it's empty, it's painful, it's busy, and it's fragile. It's fragile because anything that's overinflated is in danger of being deflated. If we're puffed up instead of filled up, the result is a superiority complex or an inferiority complex. And in fact, they are one and the same. They're totally self-absorbed. Self-absorbed, empty, painful, busy, and fragile. And Paul wants us to know what the difference this grace, this gospel makes and how it transformed these things for him. It's important for us. Back up, if you can, Sheila, to 1 Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 4. Paul says, see, with me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not my own self. For I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified. But he that judges me is the Lord. So Paul tells these Corinthians, he doesn't care what they think about him. He doesn't care what anybody thinks about him. In fact, his identity owes nothing to what people say. Their evaluation, their verdict, it doesn't mean anything. If that's my liver transplant, (laughs) I'll take it, praise the Lord. But Paul goes even further here, and he says this, I won't even judge myself. I don't care what your judgment is. I don't care what anybody's judgment is. I don't even care what my judgment is. Now, why is that? Because comparing ourselves among ourselves, you can have a standard, and I can look at that standard. You're probably not keeping it either, but that's your standard. And I look at it, and I know I can't keep it, so I just lower the standard. I I still have a code that I live by, a standard that I live by, but I innately know that it's low. I know it's low because I'm meeting it most of the time. Right? I mean, if I'm honest. So even if, I, even if I've got a clear conscience, it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean I'm not guilty. Hitler could have had a clear conscience, but it didn't make him not guilty. You see what I'm saying? And that's what Paul is saying. He says, I don't care what you say. I don't care what anybody says. I don't even care what I say. Praise the Lord. The fact that he has a clear conscience, he says, that doesn't matter either. You can have a clear conscience and still be guilty. Verse 4 says, For I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified. But he that judges me is the Lord. So my conscience is clear, but that doesn't make me innocent. Just because my conscience doesn't bother me, doesn't really give me any consolation. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15. And here's where he says, yet am I not justified? This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Not I was chief. I am chief. This is after his conversion, after his great revelation, after seeing Jesus on the road, to, you know, he, after everything, he says, the faithful saying, worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. I'm the worst. 
Now, this is amazing, and this ought to help you if you can understand what he's saying here. I am. See, we, we aren't used to people who say all these uh, bad things about themselves. In other words, who, who say, look, I'm a jerk. I, I get it. I make all kinds of mistakes. I'm not a good person. I, in many ways, I, I'm, I, I make poor decisions. And yet that person has confidence that is just overflowing. And that's Paul. He's saying, look, I get it. I, 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 I'm a mess for all practical purposes. And yet the guy's going around healing the sick, raising up the dead, uh, preaching grace, has tremendous revelation. He's full of confidence. When in fact, in the natural world, we say, he ought to have low self-esteem. We ought to be treating him at some psych center somewhere because he's going to be an introvert. He's going to be all messed up because he's saying, look, I'm, a jur I'm just no good. I'm blah, 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 blah. But it doesn't bother him to say that. He still has this great confidence that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. There is no limit on, my, uh, on what I can do, amen, through Jesus. Amen? He's flawed, but he's confident. Church, that's where we've got to get. That's where we've got to get to. Praise the Lord. We, we haven't done it. Why? Because we're always judging ourselves. Or we're letting somebody else judge us. And Paul won't do that. He won't let the Corinthians judge him. He won't judge himself. But he says, I know about my sins. I know about my flaws but he won't connect him to his identity. His sins and identity are not connected. They're separate. But neither does he see his accomplishments. He's not patting himself on the back for starting this church or starting that church or doing this thing. You see what I'm saying? He's not going to beat himself up for things that he's done or things that he's doing, but he's not going to take any glory for accomplishments either. And that's important because you can't have one without the other. So he, doesn't just, he just doesn't connect them to himself. He's not self-loving, and he's not self-hating. He is self-forgetting. I've been crucified with Christ, yet I live. But it's not me that lives. It's Christ who lives in, through me. He's self-forgetting. He's not beating himself up over the things that, he's done, that he does wrong. He's not having a great parade and a celebrate me uh, because I did something right. He doesn't connect them to his identity. See, the self-forgetting person is a person whose self is like the toes that we were talking about. They don't hurt. So he's not even aware of himself. It just works. The toes just get me to my destination. The self just puts me in a position that I need to be in to do whatever it is God's doing. But I don't connect it to my identity. I don't connect it to who I am. I'm crucified. It's Christ that now lives. So I can't identify good or bad to me. Praise the Lord. It just works. Praise the Lord. It doesn't draw attention to itself. The toes just work. They're not aching. You don't need to soak them. You don't have to do anything. They just work. The self just works. How did Paul get there? And he tells us, but you have to look really careful to see it. Back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, or chapter 4 again, uh, verses 3 and 4. 
But with me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not my own self. For I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified. But he that judgeth me is the Lord. Justified, he says. Justified. So what Paul is looking for, what all of us are looking for, is an ultimate verdict. A final verdict. Justification. And because of that, in every situation, in every circumstance, we're evaluating ourselves. We're evaluating others. We're on trial. Every day we put ourselves on trial. Knowing what I know about grace, the freedom, the beauty of the truth, the, the liberty that it brings, and yet I find myself on trial every day. Every day we're being tried. And that's the problem, Paul says, with self. The trial's over for Paul because the ultimate verdict is in. Verse 4, yet am I not hereby justified? He that judgeth me is the Lord. It's the Lord who judges Paul. And it's the only opinion that Paul cares about. And his opinion is the righteousness of God in Christ. You are a sinner made perfect through Christ. Romans chapter 8 and 1, you don't have to go there, Sheila, but it says, because of this, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh or after the self, but after the Spirit. Praise the Lord. So because Jesus went on trial instead of me, right, there's no condemnation. If, if I'd have been on trial, there'd have been condemnation. That I'd have been condemned. But because he took my place in trial, I've been declared innocent. The ultimate verdict. The final verdict. Praise the Lord. So why worry about rejection? Why worry about assessment? Why worry about other people's evaluations? Why worry about your own? That's what Paul's saying. We've been justified. We've been taken into God's family. We are among or in the beloved sons and daughters in whom God is well pleased. Praise the Lord. Yes. See, true Christian identity operates totally different from any other kind. Went to visit my mother at the nursing home. Well, I was there yesterday, but uh, last week or earlier in the week when I was there, she had a cow. What kind of cow is it? Holstein. Not that that really matters, but it was a black and white cow, and I never can remember. I know the Guernseys are the brown ones. I think that's like uh, Elsie, but I wasn't raised on a dairy farm. My wife was. I just know milk. If it's cold, it's not bad, praise the Lord. So. Uh, anyhow, so she's got this cow. I'm thinking, what, what is my mother doing with this stuffed cow? It happened that it was her roommate who passed away gave it to her. So I pick it up and I'm trying to figure out what, I mean, you know, a stuffed cow? It's not, the, you know, it's not something that I think of as cuddly, you know, a cow. It's not like a teddy bear or something, but. So I squeeze his stomach and he starts singing. <laughs> Don't worry, be happy. I mean, even with the Bob Marley Caribbean accent. And I nearly fell out. I thought, <laughs> everywhere I go, the Lord is speaking. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Don't worry. Be happy. Praise the Lord. If every day 
you're being sucked back into the courtroom. You're not happy. Praise the Lord. You, you have to relive the gospel. You have to relive grace, in other words, every time you pray. Every time you go to church. Every time you get up in the morning. I'm not talking about a ritual. I'm saying you've got to reestablish your identity. What grace has made available to you. You've got to do it on a continuous basis. You have to be conscious of this. Praise the Lord. If you find yourself judging, being judged, ask yourself, what am I doing in court? I don't belong here. Court's adjourned. Think about it. Every time you feel that, you should say, I'm, hey, wait, 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 wait. I don't belong in this. I'm not in court. I don't care what you think. I don't care what you, how you judge. I don't care how I'm judging at this moment about something I'm thinking or did or whatever. Jesus is the only one that matters, and he has declared me justified. Don't let the devil keep, he's the accuser of the brethren. Don't let him keep dragging you back into the court, amen, where an ultimate verdict has already been declared, amen. That's what he does. He uses people to do it. He'll use you to do it. He'll get you to condemn yourself for something there is no condemnation for. Praise the Lord. Court is adjourned. I don't care what you think. I don't even care what I think. Jesus said it. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And you are my beloved child in whom I'm well pleased. Live that life. And you won't worry. And you'll be happy. Praise the Lord. That's all I got. We need to realize we have let the natural world, oh, we're so worried about people having low self-esteem. Low self-esteem, overinflated self-esteem, it's all the same. It's puffed up. And if you get puffed up, if you've ever had anything swollen, see, there's really nothing in there. It's empty. But it's painful. It draws attention to itself. It hurts. And it's fragile. Bump it and find out. That's the self. For the last couple of generations, we've been so busy trying to get people, oh, don't, don't let them fail. They'll have low self-esteem. Everybody's a winner. And because of that, everybody's miserable. Everybody's always evaluating, always judging, always critiquing themselves and everybody else. And that's what Paul says, I've learned, I've discovered. One of the greatest revelations Paul has, he's revealing to us right here. It's not you. It's Christ. Don't let anybody judge you. Don't bother judging anybody else. Don't even let yourself judge you. Declare the final verdict, not guilty, justified. Amen. Praise the Lord. Be bold. See, we can be yes. failures with the greatest confidence. Yes. I mean, failures in terms of how, the, how we're evaluated you know, by the world or by other Christians. Right. I care. I really don't care. Now, I've said that a lot. And, and to some degree, I always believed it. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Now, there's a lot of things I could say right now, but... <laughs> You know, when, when, you, when you do things like this, or if you were a business person or on a job, you're always evaluated. You're always, and if you're, if you're not being evaluated, you're evaluating yourself, and you're saying, well, I'm, you know, I'm maybe not the best employee, but I'm not that slug. I mean, at least I show up on time, and, you know, I'm not off three days a week, and, you know, you know what I'm saying. Yeah. If, you're, if you're further up the food chain, then you're evaluating yourself all the time, too, because you want to get the most productivity out of the people that, that, you know, that work for you and you want to provide an environment where they can succeed and so on and so forth. So you're evaluating based on them. You're evaluating yourself a lot of times based on what they're doing. And as a pastor, I can tell you when people leave, amen, like their hair's on fire, 
there's a little bit of self-evaluation goes on in the process. Right. Like, what did I say? What did I do? What didn't I do? What could I have done? What might I not have done? Amen. But I, I'm saying, I, it isn't that I don't care, but I don't care. Yeah. Praise the Lord. It doesn't matter. What I've learned is, you can bend over backwards and you can do all kinds of stuff for some people and they thumb their nose and go on about their business anyway. And you can be a jerk to another person and they'll come pat you on the back and tell you, you, you know, you're all right, you're okay. It's, it's the evaluation process is different in everybody. But it's, it's, it's not good. It's not good. Because I can puff myself up and say, well, what a great man of God I'm doing. Knowing that somebody's coming along with a pen any moment to pop that bubble. Right? You can overinflate. You can deflate. But they're the same thing. They're looking at you instead of at him. Praise the Lord. So what Paul is telling us the quicker we can be like Paul. So what happens sometimes is you come off as being indifferent. That wasn't that, G that Paul was indifferent because obviously he went out, risked his life over and over and over to reach people who didn't really want to be reached. So he wasn't indifferent. He was just indifferent to their attitudes. He cared about their soul, about their spirit, about doing, uh, being a revelation of Christ, but he didn't care what their response was in terms of how they looked at him. He didn't even care what he thought, because I'm sure there were many times he went to bed and thought, man, I shouldn't have had that big argument with Peter. That really didn't accomplish a whole lot, you know. And, but he had him. I shouldn't have kicked John Mark off the uh, evangelistic team, you know. But I did. But he didn't go crawl in a cave somewhere and lick his wounds and feel sorry for himself. He just said, it don't matter. Doesn't matter what I think, doesn't matter what he thinks, doesn't matter what anybody thinks. God has justified me. So I can be bold. I can come boldly to the throne of grace. In other words, I can come into any situation expecting God's favor to be there for me. That'll give you courage. That'll give you confidence. That'll give you a boldness that you'll never get by evaluation, by measuring yourself among yourselves. Amen? I don't care what other preachers are doing. Thank God they're doing something for the Lord. I don't care. It doesn't matter. It doesn't affect me. It doesn't have anything to do with me. No, if they're having millions come or if they've got three. No. It, what, it, what, it doesn't matter. No. It doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what I think. It only matters what he thinks. And he says, good boy. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. He's saying the same thing about you. That's our identity. That's who we are. That's how we live our lives. And we'll be successful because we'll be focusing on him instead of on us. Every time, let me just say, close with this. Every time, and you'll do it tomorrow, I promise you. Before the day's over tomorrow, you'll be in court. And the moment that re realization comes to you, just say, court's adjourned. The verdict has already been reached on this. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. Give him a hand clap this morning. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Amen. Live that. And you will be successful. And people will be drawn to that confidence. Praise God. Amen. Have a great, great week. Amen. Happy New Year again, if we haven't already had a chance to tell you that. Go in the power and the authority of his grace. Amen. You've been set free. Hallelujah. Go enjoy it. Don't worry. Be happy. Praise the Lord.